Okay, well, I'm up next. I'm Lisa Thomas Barnett. I'm the uh, on-site archaeologist for San Nicolas Island for the Navy, and I'm just going to be giving um, a photographic overview of, of everything that we found in the box cache. Okay, and as I pointed on the earlier session, San Nicolas Island is one of the four Southern Channel Islands, and we're the furthest out from the coast. We have a real flat central plateau, surrounded by a uh, coastal plateau, so we're a little bit different than the other islands. Go. Go. There we go. So as Bill's film has already pointed out, um, this is such an incredible find. It's, call it luck or timing or whatever. Um, I've actually stood in that spot several times over the years and there was absolutely nothing visible. <clears throat> so by good fortune, John, the four of us, John Erlinson, Troy Davis, Renee Villanueth and I were just happened to be in the right place at the right time. And making this even more remarkable is that this whole area is closed every year from uh, March 1st to September 15th uh, in order to protect the western snowy plover habitat. So if we hadn't been out looking for uh, these older soils for Troy Davis's project, chances are that this box cache could have become uncovered, washed away, and gone, and we never would have known. Uh, like uh, Bill's film pointed out, while the ooh, end piece of that one box uh, had blown off, fortunately it blew up the cliff, um, a few of the artifacts had started to come out, but it really didn't look like we lost anything. So chances are the whole thing is intact and, and nothing fell off the edge of the cliff. Um, even so, we of course deemed that emergency recovery was w warranted, so we pretty much ditched Troy's project for the whole weekend and just focused on this. <laughs> the two boxes, this is the west box and the east box, were um, excavated over the course of two days. To the right, you can see what's left of one of the water bottles. This is just the base that still had a bunch of tarring pebbles in it, and this is a unworked whale rib that was on the top. And John Erlinson will be discussing um, the box attributes and the Pacific Northwest artifacts that came out of this in the very next paper. Uh, removal of the water bottle, or the removal of the boxes revealed two more almost completely intact water bottles. And while the basketry had been completely decomposed, the asphaltum linings were in fairly good shape. Faced with the fact that we didn't have enough time or proper materials necessary for the safe recovery of the bottles, it was decided that they would be removed at a later date. The bottles were covered with beach sand and then wet kelp placed over it and rocks put on top of it for stability. The idea was that the moisture from the kelp would help keep the sand intact and keep it from blowing away. So several weeks later, myself, Renee Villanueth, Steve Schwartz, along with Jane Mitchell, returned to tackle the task of excavating these water bottles. I asked for Jane's assistance since she has a background in excavating a variety of fossils and was familiar with non-destructive stabilization techniques for the removal of fragile items. The exposed sides of the bottles were each separately wrapped in several layers of saran wrap with a layer of aluminum foil over it and then covered with medical bandages. You can see we're wrapping it with the saran wrap right there. Uh, the bandages were applied just thick enough to give the bottle support, but were flexible enough to be cut away with scissors at a later date versus needing a Dremel tool, which would have, certainly that kind of activity would completely dis destroy the, uh, the tar shell. Uh, they were also only wrapped three quarters of the way around to allow the soil to dry and the weave pattern to be visible. We were worried that since they are so fragile that conserving them intact may not be possible. If not, this will still allow us access to that cordage pattern for further study. When we started excavating the contents of the boxes, Renee and I anticipated that we would find maybe a dozen or so artifacts between these two little boxes based on their size. We never imagined that it was going to be closer to 200 artifacts. And this also shows that there had been another basket of some sort that uh, had the bottom tar lined or the inside tar lined, but 
no, um, nothing else was left of it except for this. Uh, next, next. Still going. No. Laboratory excavation of the boxes revealed a total of 35 artifacts from the east box and 171 from the west box with 23 items from outside the box together. Items of local Nicolaino manufacturer, alludic objects, and a historic component with items such as, a bo as bottle glass bifaces and nails were found inside. So this is a picture of all the unmodified bone that came out. Uh, some people have suggested that this was a looter's cache or something that the ranchers would have picked up, but I feel based on the, the nature of many of these items that what we're looking at is clearly a toolkit belonging to a native Nicolaino. The cache has items in uh, many stages of manufacture from unmodifi unmodified pieces such as the bird bones, ooh, uh, fish bone, and a whole bunch of, uh, I believe it was 43 unmodified dolphin teeth. And that's just not something that your average rancher is going to go around and pick up and collect. <clears throat> And this slide shows the formal bone artifacts. Uh, I know it's a lot to look at, but most of these were either presented on at the poster session or will be discussed shortly by other presenters. There are 29 formal bone artifacts. Um, here are some of the eludic items. That would be this and this one. Uh, some of the Nicolaino pieces. Probably the dolphin rib. Ooh, where is it? There you go, fish bone. And as you can see, there's a mix of utilitarian items such as fasteners, knives, wands, ornaments, and a couple of whistles. Oh, that slide doesn't have the whistles. What do you know? Sorry. I got off on my slides. <clears throat> so going back to, this is one of the wands. Uh, this is a dolphin rib that was drilled out. Here's a bunch of the Pacific Northwest Coast items and the bird bone whistles. The cache also contained uh, several unmodified seashells and a couple of slightly modified shells. This Laudia, it's very hard to see, but there's actually about seven or eight cut marks in it, and only one goes all the way through the shell, so I'm not really sure if that was uh, for sharpening or what they were doing with that. We also had five modified shells, two of the abalone, these are really interesting that neither one of these has any open siphon holes and they're completely uh, full grown adults. So it's not like someone ground off the end to obliterate the siphon holes. They just uh, genetically didn't have any open holes. But they were both punched back open on at least one of these siphons. The other three abalone all had their siphon holes plugged with tar. Uh, some of this was already discussed in a Miranesis poster on the abalone container on Tuesday. Certainly that one and I think that one. And this is a picture of the abalone cache or the abalone container. It had a total of 22 artifacts placed inside of this black abalone. These are all the artifacts. And it was capped off with this um, abalone that uh, was upside down, cortical side down, so it wasn't glued together like a typical jewel box. And this shows the eight formal shell artifacts that came out of it. So the two fish hooks, two abalone rim pendants, a uh, scallop that had been drilled out with the uh, ochre and a couple others. We had a third button, I guess we're calling it, but it was too fragile to take out of the baggie. So we have uh, several unmodified lithic items, including materials such as these root casts, the iron chunks, and the red ochre. And all of those do occur naturally on San Nicolas Island. Um, there are also several uh, trade materials, such as these pieces of steatite and this big green stone right here. Now, if you're not a geologist, you should always have a geology book on hand. Uh, we learned that the hard way. We were passing this around and a few people started to complain that their hands were itching, so we looked it up only to discover that this is called actinolite, and it's a raw form of asbestos. So <laughs> we don't take it out of the bag anymore. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, other items included two, two effigies. Oops. There's this little guy here and this one, and an incised pipe. And these were presented on earlier at the poster session by Queenie Lapina and Brendan Greenaway. But I will point out that the pipe, it, you can't see it in here, but it has a repeated X design all the way around it. Uh, this looks like a broken pelican effigy that was reutilized because it does have engraving right there. And this little guy looks like an elephant seal effigy. And it also has X's across its headband. And when you turn it over, it has a triple X design across its tummy. And that's also when you can see that it's an elephant seal because it has the big proboscis on it. We've also got six of what we're calling burnishing stones. These were fire affected, and they have tar on several of them. A possible hot tar spreader, sandstone dish, couple of what we're possibly calling wet stones, which would be this guy and this guy, uh, pressure flaker, drill, something that looks like a little broken surfboard, I have no idea what it is, and uh, eight soapstone ornaments that Richard Gutenberg will be presenting on um, all of the ornaments later in this session. There are nine flaked bifaces and two ground bifaces. Uh, three are of local San Nicolas Island lithic material, which is this one, this one, and this one. Uh, six of them are Monterey banded chert, and those are up there. And the other pieces may be from the Pacific Northwest. Uh, these were presented on earlier by Chelsea Smith during the poster session as well. And like I said, John Arlinson will get more into the Pacific Northwest artifacts. Not really going to discuss these too much because Kevin Smith is going to be presenting this as our last paper, but it's just such a great example of the preservation of this cache that if these artifacts hadn't been in a redwood box that was stuffed into a niche, there is absolutely no way you would get this kind of preservation. <clears throat> uh, Jessica Colston already presented on the historic artifacts on Tuesday, so I'm, I'm just going to give a brief recap of these. There are three metal nails, which I think would be great as pressure flakers for making your bifaces. A uh, little iron knife, a button, some hunks of metal, and what I think is a barrel hoop. But I imagine that that would have been a really, really nice uh, abalone pry. And, oh. Here we have these beautiful clear gla bottle glass bifaces and some of the pieces of the bottle, so we know at least at least one of these was definitely a square bottle. And then we've got the uh, green bottle glass bifaces and a piece of the bottle right there. It's a little hard to see, but the bottle has quite a steep curve to it. And I'm hoping that one of the historic items, maybe the, the bottle glass or the button, will be unique enough to have a really tight time period of manufacture to narrow down the box's age even more. Ideally, one of these artifacts would be made after 1835, but before 1853, making this Juana Maria's belongings. But I, I think that's pretty big stretch to hope for. So just a final rundown. We didn't photograph all the, you know, rocks and just kind of mis miscellaneous seashells, but these are the nicer artifacts that were found outside, kind of behind the boxes, and then. These are all the artifacts found in the East Box. And it's really hard to get an idea of how amazing this is and why we thought there was going to be so few items per box. So I actually made a couple of replicas. So it was 35 artifacts came out of a box this size. I mean, that's, that's pretty impressive. And then even more amazing. Oh, is all of these came from a box this big. That's why we were really only expecting a handful and uh, quite the nice surprise. <laughs> So again, thanks to everyone who spent so many of their weekends taking time off of work, 
you know, paid for your own barracks room, uh, suffered under, you know, pretty, pretty long conditions to help out and also helping me get this presentation together. Um, I can't say thanks enough and I look forward to keep working with you guys in the future. So.